potential for a win-win-win. Uh, I marvel at the uh, workload the planning board has been dealing with historically, but certainly in the last 18 months, it's unprecedented and it doesn't appear to be waning much uh, as we look forward. Um, so I, I, I worry about your stamina and your ability to keep doing what you've been doing. Um, and so if there's a way to help alleviate some of that workload in front of you, I see that as a something worthwhile pursuing. Similarly, I think uh, there could be benefits to staff in terms of just efficiency. Um, and lastly, I think the certainly the development community would see some value in a streamliner process. And uh, make no mistake, this isn't about um, cutting corners by any stretch. It's just about kind of simplifying the review process, um, but still holding the same standards. So uh, pleased to be part of the conversation and, and I'll, uh, I'll be quiet. So There's Nick, a sign that says your two minutes was up. <laughs> and Nick, as, as I had Thanks, said, um, uh, Karen, did you have anything uh, you wanted to chime in with on this yeah, or develop? Yeah, I just wanted to echo everything that um, Jay and Tom have said. Um, you know, obviously, streamlining is great for um, everyone, particularly if it's streamlining um, that achieves all the goals that you want us that you want to achieve with the. Um, review process. You know, Jay and I have been talking about industrial review since way before the, the downs. And like you said, it's just one of those things. We've got so many things before us. We just hadn't done that before. Um, but other communities are using it. And I will say, I think the thing that Jay and I have seen is the, it's used very differently all across the, the different communities. Um, there is a focus, I think, on industrial particularly, but they all do it in slightly different ways. So there's no right way or wrong way. And I think that's what we're looking for is um, what makes sense for Scarborough. But certainly from an um, from a energy and uh, uh, streamlining standpoint, this just makes so much sense. Thanks, Karen. Did you have this? Uh, no, not at this time. I'll jump in as you guys discuss if you have questions or whatever. And maybe Angela too, just kind of get more perspective if, if any was needed to be added. I know Angela had mentioned it. Uh, speak for herself. <laughs> I am I am on and I'll help um, any technical com uh, questions or comments as we go through. Just let me know. Thanks, Angela. And Nick, as I said, um, uh, so I think, go ahead, Jay. I was just going to mention, um, we do have Dan and Rocky uh, as attendees. Um, and so, you know, if we want to have, see if they want to say anything early on here, or they're just along for the ride, or how, how would you like to handle uh, other participants? I, I think for, for at least for what it's worth on my end, I think it's worthwhile to hear the applicant's point of view. I mean, no, I mean, we get on the board level, we and, and the staff level, I think we clearly see some of the things, but being an applicant probably behind the scenes also comes with its own challenge when going through the process that we have. So I'm not opposed to hearing them give us a little, um, you know, a little information on what it's, you know, what, what they see as their challenges and how they think that this could be a smoother process. So I, I have no problem with them uh, kind of so weighing in us understand their perspective a bit more. All right, I'm going to click the allow to talk button here. And actually, first, I I am remiss in saying I missed Ken on this. Ken, did you have anything you wanted to add? I'm here to listen and, and, and learn. Uh, in my 35 years here at the town of Scarborough, I think I used something very similar. I, I developed a private way. So I had to go through all the typical requirements with, uh, you know, wetlands impact and uh, sanitation district and, and everything, but it was more of a staff review through uh, Angela. And uh, so I'm, I'm kind of assuming this is a similar process that you can standardize something uh, that benefits all development, not specifically the downs, but maybe a certain subset of uh, industrial development like light, light industrial. Uh, so again, I'm, I'm just here to listen, learn, and share with my fellow counselors when we get back to the chambers. But thank you. 
Thanks, Ken. And welcome, Jennifer. I saw you've signed in. Um, we've just kind of, just to catch you up, we've got the uh, general overview of what we're discussing. And then uh, right now, um, I've asked Rocky and Dan to kind of give us some perspective on their thoughts and also kind of, you know, some of the reasoning behind, you know, they get to be the applicant a lot of time in front of us and Dan, their points of view too, as we go through this. So that's where we are. All right, uh, Dan and Rocky, go ahead. Uh, thanks. Uh, and thanks for having this workshop. I really appreciate it. Speaking of workload, you guys already have a, a huge workload with the regular planning board meeting. So um, hopefully this, this can help in that regard a couple of months down the line. But again, appreciate taking this item up um, after it being introduced a while back. Um, <clears throat> I think Tom and Jay summed it up really well um, from from my perspective. Um, it is something that's pretty common that I've seen in the neighboring communities for industrial light industrial uses. So from a kind of a competitive standpoint and the end user standpoint, I think it certainly would benefit the town of Scarborough uh, Innovation District and also other industrial zones if the kind of the review process playing field was um, leveled a bit um, because I know Saco, Portland, Gorham, the kind of the communities that see a lot of the same end users um, have that administrative process. So that certainly could help attract maybe more of the light industrial, industrial end users to Scarborough. So I would see that as a benefit uh, through this process. Um, and I think the other kind of thing and the, the board's been living it recently all the <clears throat> a lot of your hard work is done at the master plan and subdivision stage so you know you've really kind of worked through those bigger issues access storm water traffic etc in in through with the design guidelines that we have for innovation district in particular it's become pretty formulaic it's become pretty straightforward in terms of design so i think that helps applicants it also can help staff um, in terms of review and, and I've found that with planning board reviews, obviously agendas are long and <clears throat> meetings are getting missed. Um, so there is a delay for some end users that can't move forward, um, but have the design already kind of worked out. So an advantage would be that um, those projects can move forward <clears throat> without competing for your time, which is on the items you really need to dig into really really need to spend that time figuring out um, versus the ones that are again pretty formulaic pretty pretty well baked based on the, the upfront work that the board did through subdivision and master plan so i think the end product development wise is going to be the same um, you've got a great staff and very attention and detail oriented staff so i think the reviews will be faster but the end product will be will be the same um, that everybody's gonna be proud of, um, but uh, you know, kind of enable the board to focus on those those other items that are less straightforward and, and need, your, need your review. So I guess that's my perspective from it. Um, Rocky may have some others, but I think it, it could be a good move that benefits everybody. Yeah, yeah if, I could, if I could jump in, I, I, I echo everything Dan said. I think that, um, you know, this, this would add, um, add an element of predictability for time frame for applicants um, that would be really helpful, especially for us at the Downs. Um, we, you know, it's no, through no fault of the board. I, I commend you. you. You folks do a lot of hard work and, and put a lot of hours in. But when an applicant sits through a meeting or two and doesn't get a chance to get heard, it really hurts them. And it hurts our ability to get, um, you know, get a project going and, and get it started and actually get it done. Um, and it ultimately it hurts the town uh, in the end because it you know just takes longer. So we think that this is something where there's a pretty good set of ground rules already set. We've got a professional staff. Uh, we really feel like they could they can handle it, and then for our applicants can meet uh, more often than the planning board uh, meets and probably get things actually started in, in the ground quicker, which would help us uh, certainly meet our our goals and our uh, with the town of Scarborough. So. Uh, that's that's about all I, I can add uh, you uh, folks taking the time to think about this. Thanks, Rocky and Dan. Um, Rachel and Roger, the, there's actually a public comment uh, ability here. 
Um, do you mind wait, holding off on those questions till we allow public comment? Is that okay? Yeah. All right. So um, with that, I'll, I'll open this up to public comment on this topic. Is there anyone here that wanted to speak? Please use the raise my hand feature. I will say there's no one on the attendees list. I think we've invited in our public. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Um, okay. So Rachel, I did see your hand up first. So uh, Rachel, would you like to go ahead? And... Yeah, I, I'd like to ask Dan. Uh, Dan, you said something uh, about the about uh, items that are less straightforward. Could you give me some examples? Yeah, sure. I mean, <clears throat> um, I mean, obviously, you, you know the level of detail you go through and the board goes through with master plan for the innovation district, um, establishing all the different expectations of the district and then subdivision that establishes even more expectations and details around engineering, stormwater, access points, et cetera. Um, so it's pretty, the, the box is pretty well defined in terms of, of site plan for a light industrial user when an end user comes along. I'm, I'm thinking of basically all other development in town. You know, typically a site plan comes in and it's on Route 1 or on Payne Road, doesn't have all those other design elements uh, finalized, doesn't have um, all the other review criteria figured out. That's what I meant is your typical site plan application um, hasn't done that upfront work that, um, that the innovation district has. Um, and it could be true in some other areas, but I'm just thinking of innovation district, all the upfront work that's, that's occurred. I, I, I'm still not clear what you, what you um, think are items that are less straightforward as far as the innovation district is concerned, because they, what I, you, if you can't name some, then you're telling me that uh, nothing in the innovation district really needs to come before the planning board. So the way yeah, I that's what I that's what I mean. I'm I'm saying that the innovation district is straightforward, and therefore administrative review is likely appropriate. That's what I'm I. Perhaps so, I misspoke earlier. Okay, so that there would be nothing to do with the innovation district anymore that would require the planning board. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying that around, I think what Jay was suggesting is yeah, no, I'm asking what you're that saying. don't need Go ahead. commercial design standards. Commercial design standards could apply to a lot in the innovation district if they're triggered. And those are like, if there was an office building, for example, is allowed in the innovation district, it needs commercial design standard review. I, th I believe the staff idea is that that would still come to you because you would look at the applicability of the commercial design standards for that land use when you wouldn't look at it for a, a light industrial building, for example. But would we look at it for an apartment building or a building uh, that we just looked at in lot six, which was a half incubator on the bottom and apartments on the top? What would our role be in that? Well, I think if, if, Go ahead. if I could, Rachel, I, I think what that's one of the things we're hoping to, to get at tonight, what the board, what the applicability, if we, you know, moving forward, understanding that there is interest at the council level of trying to bring some language forward, what does the board think the level of applicability would be? Um, so happy to continue on the conversation, but I just wanted to well, be clear. Well, in, in, I understand, and, and that's why I'm trying to find out where the developer sees the I, I'm not, I, I don't think there's really a bright line that nothing is included or everything is included. And I think what we're trying to do is to find where um, both parties essentially are comfortable uh, saying, here's administrative and here's what gets brought before the board. So with the innovation district since we have seen some buildings develop in there it's it's helpful to me at least to to use how we approach them to get the sense of what would be different and once we can understand what would be different for instance in the case of that hybrid building um then that starts to lead us into uh some some of the areas where 
we might get involved or we might not get involved. So I, I think a conversation really has to do some exploration, uh, especially with the, the innovation district of what this means. I mean, I, I have my notion. It might not be Dan's notion or Rocky's notions or Roger's notion or, or, or your notion. So I, I think a full, a, a real exploration of that will help us focus in on what what might need to be changed and what we might want to say, no, nah, you know, this really does come before us. Because right now I'm not entirely clear. So what, the discussion's what? helpful. I'm the least educated around the table here in this discussion, but one way to look at it might be to uh, identify a subset of the permitted uses in the innovation district. There's a, a number of permitted uses, but then there's a subset that don't have design standards that apply. So I'm not saying that that's the way to go, but that might be a way to define what, what can go the administrative re review track and what needs to go back through the conventional planning board process. So uh, let me explore that for a minute, Tom. And we have now seen um, three buildings um, that are labeled as incubator, um, or uh, basically for small businesses that might want to move out of their their garage and into a larger space, and then you know not quite ready for a full building for themselves. So we have we have three of those, um, and as I look at the designs, there's a lot of similarities when you're dealing with something that's incubator. Uh, as, we have, as, we, as we have seen them um, presented to us through, uh, you know, through the, the various, uh, the Oyster LLC and uh, Lot 6 and Lot 7. Um, we've also seen something like the car, the throttle club, which is really sui generis. I don't think we're going to see another throttle club come in, but we are likely to see more incubators, incubator buildings. I mean, that's a, that's a possibility. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of like the idea of starting to um, focus on the types of buildings, especially once we've seen how, how one works to be able to say, yeah, so if another incubator comes through, and the design and the function is essentially the same, then maybe that's not something we need to take a look at. Although we might want to see the very first one mm -hmm. so that we, we understand how it works. I, and I, I don't know if that's the, the direction, but I, I do like the idea of um, kind of separating out some of the, some of the functions. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I don't have the answer, but I think there needs to be a very bright line and very clear and understandable line as to what can go administrative uh, review and what can't. Uh, so it seems to me use matters and maybe something around whether uh, design standards apply could be ways to start to define that line. For what it's worth, I think um, I think the addition of the residential units into the innovation district kind of muddied the waters a little on my end. And I say that only because there are buildings that are going to go in that clearly won't have to meet commercial design standards, but it's possible that directly across the street we have residential units. Um, and what does that do? So I, I get that some I know, warehouse style building isn't going to require us to really review uh, if it's got enough shutters and windows in place but um you know what does it do when you have a residential component onto a light industrial commercial area in the street and should we be careful not necessarily careful should we make sure a plan like that is in front of us um because the other portion of this that I, i'm probably concerned about is the public comment uh, ability so you know whatever ordinance language gets drafted is how are you going to be able to incorporate the public comment um, and noti notification of a project that comes into the area. So, and I think that's going to be a challenge if you're trying to write up something. And then uh, <clears throat> I also think that, you know, and that the other part of this is I remember going through the marijuana ordinance and allowing medical marijuana manufacturing and things like that into this district. And with the addition 
question of residential, are we making a potential, you know, are we creating a potential issue in, in the residential area there where you might be next to an end user that is, you know, manufacturing, maybe creating odors. And yes, I know there are ordinances in place, but are we creating a sticky situation there as well? So like, like I said, I, with the addition of the residential units into the district, it, I almost feel like the board input oversight and commenting on it becomes more critical rather than, than the back end administrative side of this. So that's, I think those are the big challenges that we'd have to try to address in anything that's written up for proposal, you know, cause devil's in the details and we all know that. Um, I would say that I think, um, it, and this is probably just more of a general question. It, when when you gentlemen, and this is more kind of Dan and Rocky and Jamel and Jay as part of the process, when you guys make a submission plan and there's a, you know, a, a couple pages of notes of, for cleanup, right? You know, you've got some notes, you know, like this, this side walks not wide enough this one you know, is there a potential to reduce that portion of the time spent in front of the board where there's a capability of you to have a back and forth structure on the details that can get cleaned up before we see have a public and i'm just i'm spitballing here so would would and that's not necessarily stuck on the three-week time frame show up in front of the board is there a plan cleanup that can be taking place place on a back with this and then it shows up in front of us so when a plan comes to it it's you know 95 percent there already i can jump in on yeah. this one if you want or do you want to talk absolutely can. go ahead jamil uh, i would i will say that staff does offer a five-week uh review process um that includes um staff and peer review prior to it getting to the board and a few of the projects you've seen have, have gone through that um and i think that does really help streamline the board's review. Um, typically they come to the board a little cleaner than the first submission. Um, and I know Dan and Rocky have experienced that through their subdivision submissions. They've pretty much done that for, for all of them at this point, I think. Um, so there, that process does exist. I don't know if it's exactly formalized, uh, but it certainly can be. And I'll just sort of add just one thing to that, you know, even that process certainly does help clean some things up, but even when there is a resubmission, frankly, when Jamel sends out our staff comments on Wednesday or Thursday, we typically, most applicants, I'm not singling anyone out, I'm saying most applicants, call Jamel, call Angela, and try to make changes to those plans Friday and Monday, right before the meeting, where staff has other things we're trying to attend to and our memos are out plans are in the board's hands it's it's really challenging so the only way to sort of address what you're talking about nick would be to not put something on the agenda <laughs> and then sort of meet with the applicant but you know we find that it's often helpful to go to the board because while there may be small cleanup things there's usually two or three points of you know the applicant wants to do you know, X, Y, or Z, and we really need the board in your judgment capacity to weigh in. And, and I think um, the way I've been thinking about this, and we'll certainly dive into this a little bit more as we talk, go through the memo and talk about the applicability and, you know, the public review process and all that, um, is really about trying to identify those type of projects where a lot of those qualitative type decision points aren't there. Again, that's where I start to think about those type of uses that maybe don't trigger commercial design standards. Um, because that's, you know, ultimately, that's why we have an independent, you know, volunteer board of citizens uh, uh, to, to do this, to sit in, in judgment. But it's when we can get down to projects that really are more black and white, do you meet the standard? Do you meet, you know, space and bulk requirements? Do you meet stormwater requirements? that are set and structured? Do you meet lighting um, capacities that are set and structured? I think those are the type of elements that maybe we could think about. Um, but I do think, you know, just in terms of streamlining, I, I, just to, I already sort of answered it. It's already sort of a, there's this tight window between that submission and staff comments going out to really try to make any further adjustments before it gets to the board on Monday night. 
Um, but that's my that's that's staff's sort of thought on it. And we're we're often pushing back on applicants to say, yeah, we we hear you. You have a new new idea for your landscaping plan. Bring that to the board. Feel free to tell the board, hey, we've seen staff comments and we're going to address it. We don't have time to review it and be okay with it or not before the meeting on Monday. A few hands go up there. Uh, Roger, uh, Dan, could you, Dan Rocky, did you guys have something to quickly respond to there? I was just going to quickly respond to the residential piece. I, <clears throat> I totally get that. I, um, it's a bit of an anomaly in the innovation district, and it also triggers subdivision um, because residential triggers subdivision. So that would be, that isn't something that that we at least expect or, or would want to have be a streamline review. It, I think it needs board review and, and consideration. I think after our first review, we made some improvements to based on board comments. So I think it's, it's really more from our perspective about the kind of the light industrial uses that don't need design standards that all the hard work and I guess in our opinion is, is been done in terms of designing for those lots um, and provide some kind of predictability in terms of review timeframes and, and is similar to what other communities are doing, you know, industrial, light industrial. So, so um, and having, I guess my, my, um, my point being though, is that you could have a project that qualifies as that light industrial and go through like an administrative process, but directly across the street from it might be that residential component. And what are they looking their window out, out their window? And what are they seeing? and whether or not the opportunity to comment on that project. You see what I'm, you know what I'm saying? Like, so you can come in with lot six and then across the street is lot 10. Lot 10 might be approved already. It might have that residential co component above it. And then you can come in with across the street, lot six, and it falls under a criteria that says this can go through administrative review process. What, what I'm saying is, is how are you gonna overcome that in language? I think if the, uh, one of the my, things that gonna, I if there's going to be an audience language about, drafted, how, that's a challenge, I would say. Yeah, I think that's one of the questions that I, I hope we can get to tonight. It's where what's the board's feeling on having the public notification, um, an opportunity to speak on if we do administrative approval. I think you know as we sort of work through some of these, I have you know really sort of laid out four or five really sort of questions that will help us craft that language. Um, so as we sort of move through sort of general questions, I hope to have the opportunity to sort of work through those. Um, Cause I think when we answer one question, it helps, helps inform what the next question is, if you will. Um. Okay. Uh, Rachel. Yeah, I, I, I want to agree with you, Nick, because one of the, the things that um, I thought again, and it helps me to think through what the board's role is uh, in maybe a little general terms, but um, I, part of our role is to look at the whole and look at the whole innovation district, not just at that particular building that somebody wants to put up there. We, we're looking at how it fits, who its neighbors are, who its neighbors, if there are neighbors, um, that that's something that's not that would be very difficult, I think, to, to put into language how we do that or what we do, except we really do. I, you know, when we're looking at it, we're saying we need more shrubbery over here because what's going in here um, needs that extra buffer um, or needs the connection to, to a trail. So we, one of our roles really is to look at the gestalt of, of the innovation district, um, not just at the individual plan. Um, I'm also gonna make a slightly snarky comment. Uh, and that is some applications that I've seen, not necessarily co uh, present company, would go through a lot faster if we weren't dealing with uh, an item that says roughly the staff continues to urge the developer to do X, Y, and Z. Uh, and um, when it, that gets to the board, what I'm thinking is this, this developer really isn't listening to what the staff is saying about 
the codes uh, about the standards and the developer, a smart developer listens to the staff and understands that the staff has got a good sense of what the board, how the board reacts to things, I, to, you know, whether it's, uh, are we going to go for a, um, a decrease in the parking aisle width? And the answer is probably yes, uh, because we frequently do, or the, the width of the, um, uh, of the driveway. Uh, but when, when the staff brings things up and a developer ignores it for to the two consecutive uh, submissions, I'm starting to say, I shouldn't be seeing this. This should have been taken care of. The staff is doing the right thing. The developer isn't listening. Uh, so I, I do have a bit of a concern when we start with the administrative review is uh, thinking about what happens when the developer isn't listening. At what point does something, no matter what it is, come to the board because the developer isn't listening, uh, even though it might be something that we seem to have settled before, and it could be the use of bollard lightning or, or lighting or 14 foot high, um, 14 foot high versus 12 foot high lights outside. You know, there are times when a developer just kind of says, well, I don't want to do this. Uh, and so all of a sudden the board is saying, yes, but you have to. Um, and you should have listened to the staff. So we do need to think about, um, as this goes through, where we do have administrative review, where we end up finding a, a, a good way to approach that. What happens when the developer just digs in his feet or her feet? When do we hear? Um, I, Karen or Tom, I said it was a race. <laughs> yeah. I'll just, I, I think, I, um, I think we've always thought of administrative review as where there's, there are few things like that, but when you get to a roadblock where staff has said, you know, our ordinance list, our, our instructions are for administrative review, you need to do X. If they don't want to do X, it, it goes to the board. Um, particularly if there is some discretion. And I, Jay, is that? Um, That's one of the items in the memo that I want to work through. It's what, what is that process? Is there a, is there an appeal process that if staff doesn't, you know, says to do X and the applicant says no, and that, that, that uh, admin review team denies the application, that it goes direct to the board? Uh, that's fairly typical. I, I think another thing that we've talked about as staff is, are there certain projects where staff might look at it and just say, you know what, this just feels above, above the scale of what we might be comfortable reviewing. And I can think of there's a, a, a business that's looking at um, occupying an existing building in Washington Avenue. And I, Karen, I'll look to you how public that is. I can't remember if everyone knows it's a uh, no, let's not. Let's let's okay. keep it. Anyway, um, there's someone looking to occupy. It's and it would be above the scale of what I think staff would be comfortable reviewing, and you all would agree. Trust me, <laughs> but they really very minimal changes to a site outside of adding parking. So I think those are again. That's part of um, what I want to dive into. That you know we're really looking for direction as we think about if again if if the general concept is, yep, we should draft some language, we really want to get some of the, those um, directions from the board on, on a couple of these items as we work through these tonight. Roger, I've seen your hand up a few times. You got to wake me up. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm kind of sympathetic to the developers here. And, um, when I um, when I raised my hand initially, I was thinking of um, of Lot 54. What's going in 54? I didn't want to mention the name. I didn't know if it was appropriate to mention the business name, but I think you all know what it is. And to me, um, that would be that would be an example of what you're talking about, I believe, right? And um, and I think what Rachel when she first initially brought up. Um, 
the residential units on lot six, that would be almost like a trigger for the planning department to say, maybe we should bring the planning board in on that. But we got, we, you know, there's, there was start off with 54 lots, I think 54 lots, there's probably like 50 now because of the combinations. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we have some great examples. Now, I think lot 54, which is before the planning board next Monday night, uh, that would be an example where you, where they, where Rocky, Rocky and Dan could, you know, illustrate to us why that may be able to just go right to the planning department instead of going before the planning board. I think that would be a good example. Uh, and I think, I mean, we still have what another 40, between 40 and 50, 45 lots there to be developed. If they're all going to be basically like the lot 54 and the other ones that have been developed so far, to me, I can totally understand once you go through the plan development process and set all the guidelines and, and the parameters and everything, then, then I'm comfortable with allowing the planning department to move it instead of having these tremendous delays in getting some of this stuff developed and, and going through all the permitting process. In, in terms of, just let me make a couple of other comments while I, while I have the floor here. Public comment. Um, I think that could be at the beginning of the plan development process. Once, once everybody understands what the rules are, that public could, could um, come in and talk about it, not with each individual lot that's being developed within the development. And in terms of um, Rachel's comments about the word urge, um, when I'm looking at staff's comments, if I see a word like shall, that's pretty definitive to me. That means it's got to be. But when I see the word urge or recommends, there's a lot of leeway there as far as I'm concerned. And if the developer can make a cogent argument as to why they want to go the way they want to go, I don't have a problem with that in, in terms of making a decision on that. So I, you know, when, <clears throat> and I can think of, um, a develop, you know, a project that um, on Route 1 that we had some strong recommendations, uh, some strong urges, say, but they argued against it. And I think their argument, you know, won the day because it made some sense, at, at least from my point of view. So anyways, those are, those are my comments. So again, again, if we, we can use Lot 54 as an example of what you're trying to do, I, you know, I, I think that might help to set some guidelines. All right, Rocky, uh, you know. Okay, so, uh, Rachel, saw your hand up. Wait, Rachel. Um, yeah, I lot 54 uh, is an example, is a good example because it's essentially a building that we've already approved. And it's simply moving to one, uh, one building on a, black, a back lot uh, is moving to another back lot. And the, the only issue from my perspective that's left because it's essentially the same building is, is the siting and, and the access. And, and that's kind of pro forma. Um, once that's determined and that's something that can be determined, I think through planning in that case, I'm, you know, I, I almost don't need to see it again. I appreciate seeing it, but essentially we've already said it's just fine. Um, so if there are cases of uh, movements of building from one lot to another, as may happen as, you know, different, uh, different circumstances come up and it's uh, more advantageous for somebody to move to a different lot and more ad advantageous for the developer. Uh, there's, there's another I mean, there's another uh, element of, of decision-making. Do I need to see a building I've already approved? Uh, once again, no. Not if the staff is comfortable, not if it's on the same element, a, a same type of lot. And if the staff uh, has taken a look at the siting, the electricity, the utilities, uh, the driveway, the road, and and essentially is is comfortable with that, then then 
I don't need to see that. So that sort of falls into the uh, category of repetition. Once we see a similar designs, um, how much do we need to see again? And I think we, we could see less, certainly. You know, in, in the innovation district, I mean, there's, there's some pretty stringent guidelines already, setback, um, landscaping, um, place settings, um, place making, I mean, and things like, I mean, there's, there's a lot of already established, um, you know, certain types of roofs, certain amount of uh, fenestration, depending whether it's a front lot or a rear lot. Uh, I mean, I think there's some pretty, you know, strong guidelines already for, the, for that district, so. Okay. So I, I just want to add um, mm -hmm. that you know, I think about the innovation district, and, and if you think about uh, the residential subdivision portion of, of this, uh, the Downs project, where we come in, we get a subdivision approved, there are permitted uses that can be done on the lot, and then we work with the staff and, and we place those houses and we build those houses. The planning board never sees it again, never gets another bite at the apple, if you will. I kind of think in the innovation district is the same way if we're doing something that's pretty simple, straightforward permitted use. If we need another subdivision approval, such as when we do a mixed use building, we're going to have residential over commercial, you know, that's a trip back to the planning board. But if it's a straightforward, you know, building fit, you know, lot 54, the building fits on the lot, you know, we've got, unlike our residential subdivisions in the innovation district, we do have strict guidelines that the staff would have as a guide to follow. Um, and so I, I feel like a lot of those buildings could be handled by the staff uh, very easily. Anything that they think, you know, is maybe a head scratcher, boom, it goes back to the planning board. If it needs any other type of approval, such as subdivision or anything else, I don't know, I can't think of anything else, but whatever it might be, it goes back to the planning board. Um, if, if a developer gets to a point where they're working with the staff and they're at loggerheads and you know, the developer saying one thing and the staff saying, no, we really think you got to do this, it goes back to the planning board. So I, I think there's a, there's a way to do it. And, and, and I was thinking about the comments about the public input. And I think when, when you, there are situations where you do need and it's appropriate to have public input. But I think about those sing, single family lots, we don't get public input on you know, us placing those houses. Lot 54, what do you need for public input? It's, it's, it fits on the lot and it meets all the criteria. If, assuming it meets all the criteria and the staff decides that it does, it moves forward. It's only when you're doing something different than what we've already planned what we've already um, agreed to with the planning board, you know, it's outside of those ground rules that we've set uh, through our design guidelines that are specialized to the innovation district, then it, then it needs to come back to the planning board. Just my- I also, um, I, I just wanna also waiver requests, uh, you know, whatever you're drafting, if there, there's a waiver request, I don't know how comfortable I am with staff having the responsibility and the onus on them to be granting waiver requests without going through a planning board.
that, you know, I think about the innovation district and, and if you think about uh, the residential subdivision portion of, of this, uh, the Downs project where we come in, we get a subdivision approved, there are permitted uses that can be done on the lot. And then we work with the staff and, and we place those houses and we build those houses. The planning board never sees it again, never gets another bite at the apple, if you will. I kind of think of the innovation district as the same way if we're doing something that's pretty simple, straightforward, permitted use. If we need another subdivision approval, such as when we do a That, you know, I think about the innovation district and, and if you think about uh, the residential subdivision portion of, of this, uh, the Downs project where we come in, we get a subdivision approved, there are permitted uses that can be done on the lot. And then we work with the staff and, and we place those houses and we build those houses. The planning board never sees it again, never gets another bite at the apple, if you will. I kind of think of the innovation district as the same way if we're doing something that's pretty simple, straight. that, you know, I think about the innovation or anything else, I don't know. I can't think of anything else, but whatever it might be, it goes back to the planning board. Um, if, if a developer gets to a point where they're working with the staff and they're at loggerheads and you know, the developer saying one thing and the staff saying, no, we really think you got to do this, it goes back to the planning board. But I think there's a there's a way to do it. And, and and I was thinking about the comments about the public input. And I think when when you there are situations where you do need and it's appropriate to have public input. Innovation district, then it then it needs to come back to the planning board. Just my I also um I, I just want to also waiver requests. And, you know, whatever you're drafting, if there, there's a waiver request, I don't know how comfortable I am with staff having the responsibility and the onus on them to be granting waiver requests without going through a planning board process. And we know that you guys might come in because you want one, one less parking spot or, less, you know, square foot of pavement for all we know. And that's, that's not going to keep in the spirit with what you're trying to accomplish here. So we have to figure out a smart way to work around a process like that. Uh, so I, uh, what my whole point of this is that this, the devil is going to be in the details and it's going to be how this is written up and it's going to really make or break whether we can move forward. But, but in that, that vein is, are there examples from Portland or somewhere that has a process like this and is there feedback that can be gathered from how it's worked there? So we don't fall into maybe a same mistake pattern from their experience. Um, and then I would just also add that, you know, as far as a process goes, if you had this administrative approval process, it made that it works to A, address the public comment worry, B, make sure the planning board is still having its oversight authority to some extent. Could it be to have an, almost like a consent item um, and a section of the agenda that 
that says administrative process, and you could read off the six that staff has vetted and approved and bring them up for, and, and still provide the materials to the planning board that evening at the top of the agenda, and at least have the opportunity board to read the project name, ask if anyone from the public was there to speak, and then have a, a one vote through from the planning board on a kind of a bing bang right down the list, kind of a bullet vote as these pro projects go through. So at least you're capturing maybe the public comment, the, the planning board oversight process of it, you know, is that I don't, a process used anywhere else in Maine or Massachusetts or who knows where? You know, I mean, has that something like that, uh, you know, akin to a consent item? I, I will say the one thing, Nick, in, in talking with um, with surrounding towns, it, they all treat it so differently. There's really, it's, there's no, there isn't great commonality. Some do it in, in all zones, regardless. Some do it only in those zones, as has already been said, in sort of more industrial, light industrial. Some do it upwards, you know, no more than 5,000 square feet of disturbance. Some say upwards of 40,000 square foot buildings and don't worry about this. So it, it's really so all over the map. Um, some have it just uh, approved by the planning director. Some have a, a, a team, a whole administrative review team. And so I think, you know, as you were saying, these are the things that I was really hoping to get guidance from the board tonight on some pretty uh, distinct direct questions. So I can, so as staff writes the language, we understand what direction the board would like. Um, so at some point I'm hopeful to be able to work through the memo because it, as we answer one question, it sort of leads to some other, you know, sort of things follow a little bit, at least in terms of how I've been thinking about potentially crafting language. Um, but again, before I do that, really need to have some direction um, as yeah, we go. If I could just follow on that. And Nick, I think those are really great points. And I think um, Portland, maybe out of any of the communities, could be a good model. And I'd say that because, number one, maybe other than Scarborough, they have a bigger workload. <laughs> At least they have in the last three or five years in terms of planning board review. Um, and that's not including the industrial, light industrial stuff that they see. So they're, um, they have a big workload, but that's already exempting out kind of the industrial, light industrial review. So they could be a good, out of the communities, they could be a good group to ask in terms of, okay, how does planning department and or other departments deal with those, those administrative reviews if you want to call them and how does that relate to their kind of review load um so just in my experience the last few years prior to only working on the downs i had some applications before them um and i mean a consent item approach you know that could be something that um uh, that could be a trial um because you you can do that now i would think um it's still a planning board approval but basically staff is reviewing the application. They're doing what they're doing now. They're just putting it on the agenda for a consent item. Um, so that could be something that you try as you think about making amendments and say, hey, well, is it working for staff? Is it working for the planning board? Um, look, you know, these are the ones that are getting approved and we would have made the same decisions as staff, for example, um, or, or you can say, yeah, these are the ones that we'd like a, a consent items. These are the ones that we'd, we'd like to review. And maybe that's a way to kind of help try it out before it's an ordinance um, or as Jay and, and your, your team group work on the ordinance changes. So I think those are you know, great ideas and maybe that's a way to proceed. Is that me? Did you say my name? Yeah, I saw your hand up, so. Okay. Yeah, um, first, uh, I just had a question about public process. Does that, um, does that require a public, like, interactive public forum, or, like, in-person public forum, or um, do we have the option to offer something like a written comment period where um, you might be able to handle 
comments coming in from the public outside of a public meeting. Do you know what, do you understand what I'm saying? Yep, I think I think I do. I mean, I guess that's one of the questions that staff would have is, is it, it would the anticipation or expectation be that we provide the same uh, level of um, public notice that we do now, you know, butters within 500 feet? And if so, um, you know, do we, you know, if it's a administrative review meeting, is that open to the public or is it just truly they're able to write things in? I think those are the type of um, direct directives we're really looking for this board for, um, you know, do we feel like, again, I, I think a lot of that's going to depend, at least in my estimation, as to where is it that we're talking about applying this activity. I know yeah. so far the focus has really been just around the innovation district, and that's where the conversation has started. Um, and if it ends there, that's fine too. But, I, you know, are we thinking about other zones? Are we thinking about in the you know, not just the industrial district. I don't know if planning board members are thinking maybe this should be applicable townwide based on certain thresholds. Um, so until I think really understanding those things might help also inform what level of public in input we need. Um, okay, um, I only ask because I, you know, for the, um, I was just curious about if there is a way to have a public process or offer projects up um, to the public for input outside of um, our, uh, aside from otherwise attaching them to our regularly scheduled planning board meetings, which would be subject to sort of a, a much less frequent um, schedule. So that's, that's what I was curious about the, you know, the written comments. And, and again, I think that, um, you know, to, to be further defined, but say for example, um, the process that you're talking about, Jay, so if the applicants were still required to notify abutters within a certain distance and sent out um, information to that end and got a bunch of, you know, and the town received a bunch of feedback, um, perhaps that could also be, uh, uh, or it, um, I guess positive feedback shouldn't necessarily be a trigger for going to the board, but you know, if, if there appeared to be an issue or concerns by the community that direct abutters, then that might also be a good reason um, for the board to hear, hear a project. And you could get to that point um, if we were able to do some of that outreach ahead of time and outside of our otherwise um, scheduled meeting, if that makes sense. And then uh, I just wanted to make a comment too about um, Portland's process. I, I work for the city of Portland. I do not work in the planning department. Um, I am aware of their previously very heavy workload. Um, there's been a lot of development happening there for a long time. And um, I, I, not to make what is already a complicated situation more complicated, but I would just advocate for um, being thoughtful of um, other town uh, input from other town agencies um, or staff outside of just the planning staff. So for example, I, I, I work in our public works department and deal with a lot of our um, uh, transportation issues and topics that might come up in the right of way. Typically these are things that um, my department, we have a liaison and my department does get um, some input on those items through the full site plan process, but we do not always get, we do not always see the same information um, through administrative reviews. And sometimes we don't need to, um, but other times it is just kind of helpful for us to, to be made aware of some of those things. So um, again, Portland, a different um, animal in a lot of ways, but I do think it's important um, if staff, you know, f for at least, um, thought to be given to whether or not other um, internal town departments might have comments on something that would otherwise just be administrative review. Roger. Um, yeah, at the beginning of this, um, when, when you talked about the introduction of this discussion, it was, we we're talking about the innovation district and also town wide. And I would recommend that we only, we just stick to the innovation district when we're talking about this change because um, 
I mean, we basically we don't we don't have to worry about the public input at this point when we're talking about strictly the innovation district. We seem to be getting hung up on how how we're going to deal with the public and get their input. And I, you know, we're not really confronted with that within the in innovation district. So in addition to that, if we if we make a change and it's effective all town, you know, town wide, I mean, we may find we could use the innovation district as a as a template to what we want to do in the future uh, to adapt to that. Um, but the innovation district is is a great is a great. Um, example for us to, to apply this right now and we can eliminate i think for the most part other than at the plan the planning process the planning development process where we get public input so just my two cents on that um yeah roger to that point i just suggest that i think the industrial district actually is even uh more to that end in terms of uh, a, a butter concerns if you will and perhaps even light industrial could be argued, whereas innovation allows uh, residential, as you know, so there, there's probably more potential for conflict in innovation than is in industrial or light industrial. Just right, but do we, I mean, do we have any other major light industrial developments going on in town right now? I'm not aware of any. Well, there's the light industrial district up uh, around Beechwood Speedway. Uh, there's not any active development projects right now, but there's a, a zone that allows industrial light industrial uses. Okay. So um, existing companies that are expanding, you know, take Abbott for example, they're adding on to an existing building. Um, so those are the types of things that um, some might do administratively. I, all I'm saying is right now we're dealing with the innovation district and we're getting hung up on the public common portion of this whole process. And I'm saying we could use that as an, you know, we limit for the most part, we can eliminate the public period because it doesn't really apply to this district. I don't believe it does anyways. And then once we, once we go through this and find out where, what's go, what's working and what's not working, then we can go town wide if we want to. Yeah. Believe me, I'm not advocating town wide. I'm saying selected uh, zones. Or whatever, you know, whatever you want to do, but instead of, Instead of, for instance, what's what may work for the innovate, innovation district may not work for over there by what would you say on Holmes Road? That's the light industrial district or the industrial district, uh, you know, the the, the park is essentially in Washington. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, we're getting we we we're, we're talking about this public comment period, and yeah, and I think what we're what we're trying to deal with right now is the innovation district and and the move these move these projects along in a more streamlined fashion. So. Mm -hmm. uh, Ken, did you have something that you wanted to say? Yeah, if, if you don't mind, uh, great discussion. And uh, again, you, you know how it works. I'm a single counselor, so I don't speak for the whole council, but I can pretty comfortably speak to the center of the council and maybe Tom can uh, either correct me if I'm wrong or suggest I'm right because I do believe you met with leadership today. The town council is looking at light industrial extended to all developers in all areas that allow light industrial, not the innovation district by itself. Just want to bring that point out because I keep hearing just innovation district and I would hate to see a lot of folks use a lot of time then bring it to the council and it's just not going to be received very well. So thought as a reminder, I would mention that. Is that correct? Right. Thanks. Yeah, I would um, concur. The, the, the sentiment um, of the counselors I've talked to is that there's applicability of this concept uh, in, in districts other than, or in addition to the innovation district, specifically light industrial and industrial. All right, um, I'm just gonna, I wanna refocus us here shortly. So I'll let Rachel and Karen say something uh, real quick, but uh, I do want to pull up Jay's memo on the screen and let, let's take it bullet by bullet, wade through some heavy issues because I think they deserve some guidance and something will um, need to come out of council and staff that can be reviewed as far as language and things. So uh, let's start uh, real quick with Rachel and then I'll Karen on the last word before we pull up the memo. 
Yeah, um, I, this is uh, in response to uh, Ken and Tom, and um, the, I, I hear what you're saying, and I think there's something that we can work on there. The, the issue with the innovation district, I guess, or the, the value of it is it is new enough, and we've been through the master plan, um, and, you know, we, we, we hashed it through, and we hashed through how it was all going to be done. So because it's a, it's a greenfield development, um, it's a lot easier to try and find those common elements that could be subject to review. When you get to the industrial district uh, past the Holy Donuts, there's, there's so much there that's already built. Um, what was the original master plan? Uh, what do we, what do we know about it? What I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know immediately where to begin if a new development came. I would have to look at past developments. I, I just, I just don't know that there are separate criteria there. So while we can and should look at other developments, say other industrial areas, um, I think they're going to require a slightly different conversation than the innovation district, simply because. As I said, the innovation district is brand new with standards that that run across all of the buildings. Um, so there may be common elements. Um, there very likely are, but I think we need more of a background in those other districts. What's what's required there, or what the what uh, what would happen with the vacant lots? How they could be built on? What were the what were the thoughts uh, to begin with, um, with those developments? When you've got a brownfield area, you've got some different, you've got some different elements to think about. Um, and the only thing I'd say, sort of back to Rachel, you know, um, um, the devil's in the detail. Like when I pulled up, uh, the town of Gorham has administrative review um, for site plan and they have under administrative review, if you want to submit, it's an eight page, very detailed checkbox. It's either, here's the standard, it's either yes or no. There's no discussion. You have to check yes or no for every one of the um, uh, uh, items on the list. And I think that's where it goes back to, you know, um, do you meet this standard? Do you meet that standard and, and uh, prove that you do? So there's a record there of why they're going through the administrative review and everything that's expected of them. And so it's very black and white. You either meet it or you don't. And then I guess I did have a question too, and this may go back to, to Jay. Um, you know, when we're talking about the industrial uh, district, um, I'm not sure what the public notification and um, is in the industrial district and whether or not um, the public hearing is different when we're in the industrial district. Um, nope. So all site plans get notified the same, regardless if it's in the industrial district, the TVC, the B3, same as any residential subdivision within 500 feet. And then the planning board allows public comment on every item. So no, no difference. But it's not, but does our ordinance require a public hearing? We, re, we uh, require subdivision. public comment. I mean, uh, it, you know, public hearing, public comment, it, you know, matter of semantics, um, you know, this, uh, we hold public hearings for zoning changes, really is the only thing we're required to hold public hearings for. Um, but public comment ostensibly hits the same point, right? People have the opportunity to speak. Can I just ask a question? Go ahead, Dan. Um, my understanding is subdivision notifies of butters in 500 feet. I didn't think site plans did. So it does. So site plans wouldn't notify butters, I guess, in any zone, as I understand it. No, we do. We notify, but it was the ordinance was changed, I don't know, oh. within the last year or two. Okay. Uh, well, there you go. Yep. Things are, things are happening outside the downs. <laughs> oh, okay. So, Jay. Like the the, um, the recent uh, redevelopment on uh, Mason Libby, you know the ice the ice project on there. Yep. 
Now, those were those abutters were all notified. Is that correct? That is correct. Yep. Okay. Now, up in the innovation district, when it, when something like when Zoom's going in, are the are the existing property owners notified? Uh, I, you know, Doreen has a, a Doreen does that for me. Um, yes, they I, are. I, okay, <laughs> and Jamel watch it. So there you go. Thank you, Jamel. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's a little different for the downs just because some of the parcels are so huge. So it's a different, um, not strategy. I'm talking about just, I'm talking about just within the, just within the innovation district though, not anything else. Mm -hmm. 500 feet buffer around all property. But so a good, a good example, Jamel, if, if I could, would be, so for lot 54, Zoom drain, lot 53, which is where Duke is construction, they would have got a notification. But I can't think of another lot name, but, you know, uh, two or three of the lots are probably owned by, you know, uh, M&R Holdings or Crossroad Holdings or whatever. I think they just get one notification, right? They don't get, we're trying not to notify uh, 75 lots that are all owned by Rocky. He doesn't need that much mail coming to him. <laughs> just once is probably good. I hope that helps. All right. So I think we kind of segued into it. Do you guys mind if we just run through the memo and, and answer or provide guidance to staff on their uh, questions that they have? Um, you guys want me to share or you want to do it, Jeff? Yeah, I have mine up right up. I've got mine up and I can read the question out loud and then that way we can all still kind of be easier maybe for me to see people raising their hand. Does that work okay? So the question, the first question they had was, as in which zones and district administrative review apply. So if we were to do this, are we talking um, downs only, uh, innovation district only, sorry, uh, or is this something that we would want to be uh, a policy or an ordinance that, that includes other areas of town? And why don't we just kind of uh, jump in member by member real quick and give a quick opinion on that. Rachel, you get to start us off. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I, I would say right now we start, start with the downs, but be prepared to move in phase two into the other districts uh, once we've gathered more information, the other uh, light industrial. Thank you. Roger? Um, before you, before you, uh, the memo you're referring to, which, what, what memo is that? Uh, J, uh, Jay had a memo. Is come out and he had a list of questions that he wanted us to focus some discussion on. Jay, did you have something you want to jump in real quick with? Yeah, and just Roger, I think I sent a memo yesterday afternoon dated October 1st on this item where I laid out four or five sort of directive questions. Um, yeah, Nick, I did have a question. I just, I just sort of want to um, just understand, I'm hearing from, um, from Ken, I can remember uh, distinctly, Tom, I think might've mentioned it as well, that there is interest on council of thinking about other zones. And so it might just be helpful to explore, Rachel, when you say you, you're thinking about the starting with the innovation district, is that uh, principally um, because of the, the master plan process and the overall subdivision sort of review process that's occurred there? And is there something that concerns you in particular, if we were to talk about um, uh, other industrial um, properties that otherwise um, don't have those sort of qualitative standards, you know, where we don't have commercial design standards, don't apply industrial districts, is there? Just want to be sure. I fully appreciate what that what that um, difference in your yeah, mind is. Just said. Um, okay. <laughs> the uh, uh, I, I guess. I do think ultimately that the um, industrial districts, industrial and light industrial districts should all be covered by administrative review. I'm however concerned a little bit about some of the details. Uh, and when I say kind of start with the innovation, really take a hard look at what would work and how it would work because that is a greenfield site. And the second, the next discussion becomes how do those, are there anything special about uh, an, uh, a brownfield district 
where a lot of the work is going to be renovation and reconstruction because of the age of the building, buildings. Um, and that then, uh, the innovation district, everything going up is new. These other uh, light industrial and industrial districts, very little at this point, new construction is going on, although that may change. Um, and the standards for renovation and uh, redevelopment of the use of a particular area, um, might we might want to look at those in a slightly different fashion. But I do think we need the, I, I do think the, the goal is um, a, an administrative review ordinance that would cover uh, that would be comprehensive enough to cover industrial light industrial. Nick, could I just ask a clarifying question as you're talking about applicability? Absolutely. And maybe I'm the uh, maybe I'm the one that doesn't understand this. Um, it's to my way of thinking, as regards the innovation district. Uh, let's say there are 18 different permitted uses. I don't know how many there are. Um, this administrative review would apply to a certain subset of those, not all of them, specifically those industrial uses or light industrial uses. That's my understanding of the conversation. I want to make sure at least I understand it and perhaps for your benefit of your members that you're all thinking similarly as you have this discussion. That's kind of that's what I'm thinking. Okay. But I, I just I didn't want to assume that. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, Roger. Um, well, first of all, I can't find the memo, Chase's memo. I have I have a memo dated uh, do you want twenty eighteen. I can share it if you'd like, Roger. Okay. Yeah, I think I'm pretty sure I sent it to the full board last night. I'll apologize if you weren't on that email. We'll obviously take a look at that, but. Um, so let's see. Can you send it to me right now, Jay? I can. Then why don't you do that then? If it's not too much trouble. All right. So in the meantime, I'll ask uh, Jen the question. How's that, Roger? That's fine. All right. So Jen, which uh, zones and districts would the administrative review apply in your mind? Um, I. I think that on, or I understand that the initial request here has, has sort of come on behalf of the innovation district, um, but just recognizing the um, demand in development that we've seen and our board has seen of late, um, we, we should reasonably expect that anyone outside of the innovation district should want sort of this, um, more streamlined staff fellow review. So I, I think that, I do think that that makes sense. Um, however, I, I also see value in what um, the, the differences between that that Rachel pointed out in that a lot of, you know, development that we could reasonably expect outside of the innovation district would probably be um, renovation in nature and um, that those within the district uh, are by and large going to be new developments. And so perhaps just being mindful of that difference as we craft um, uh, criteria would be important. But um, generally, yes, I think that we should apply this to um, any of our industrial light industrial areas and not solely um, just the down, the innovation district, sorry. Thanks, Jennifer. Roger? Yeah. Um... I would, I guess basically I would agree with that. I think whenever you have a um, a major project, you know, such as the innovation district, or say the industrial park if it was just starting up from scratch, and you had a set of guidelines, as we do with the innovation district, I I, I don't have a real problem with the uh, with the administrative review process, um, unless. You know, other than if um, if something unusual were to be presented, such as the residential, you know, the apartments. So, 
mean, I I understand what Ken was saying about the town council, but I just I, I don't you know personally. I think we should we have we have an experiment right here where we can work with this thing, and then we can adapt it either throw what doesn't work and or add something that does work and apply it to the rest of the um, rest of the town at some point when it's when it's um, when we feel we have it down pat, but. All right. Thanks, Roger. Uh, Rick Meinking. Um, yeah, I, I, I think for me, administrative review for new construction where we already have design standards or guidelines, and, and I think it's important to understand the distinct difference between, you know, a code, a standard, and a guideline. Um, when we deal with issues that are code based, well, that's cut and dry. You got to do it. And standards are really designed to give you the how you go about meeting that code. And then you have guidelines that are just arbitrarily put before a bunch of people and they say, okay, uh, I like that set of guidelines. Um, and I think with innovation district, those guidelines have been established. And so it does make it a little bit more palatable to do administrative reviews because um, the guidance is there. And so definitely the innovation district. And then when we talk about adding the light industrial districts and the industrial districts, and you already have a built environment um, doing renovations on an existing building, I think is not something that you just want to, you know, put it through real quickly because it could have character changes. It could have impacts on what's already been built in that environment. Um, so I'm coming out with the idea that, you know, if, if this is new construction, it's the first building on the lot and it's in an area or in a district where the guidance has been put forth already, like the guidelines in the innovation district, then I think the staff should have the ability to, to push things through a little bit quicker if the developer uh, works with the staff and says, yes, I'm meeting these uh, standards and codes, and uh, we're all in agreement that this meets the letter of the, the law. The, the sticky part comes for me is when there's waiver requests in there, even on a brand new lot that never had a, a building put on it. Um, and I think those can kind of be done more on a, like Nick, I kind of like the suggestion on a consent agenda where when there's these little waivers that need to be put through, um, yeah, it can be done rather quickly. Uh, that's where I'm coming out. I, I don't really think just doing the innovation would send a good signal to everybody out there that we're trying to push the, the, the innovation district, we're pushing those projects through fast. We just want to get something built in there. Um, I, I think optically, if we expand it to the other districts, it it makes it a little more palatable for, you know, the design and developing community in in Maine. Uh, that's I guess where I'm coming out. Thanks, Rick. Is that is that uh, am I missing any anyone on the board side here for feedback? I'm scrolling through my panel. I think that's all. Uh, so I'll, I'll get real quick. I, I tend to agree that it should apply to other areas that could fall under the same standard. I, I think I think we got to be a little careful here. Um, is I, I no one can deny the importance of one the entire project to this town, but to this district to the project. So, uh, but I think we just need to be careful that uh, we guard against. Uh, other developers thinking that there's 
um, you know, a, a certain process for one group and not another. I, you have to watch out for that kind of thing, especially in town. I think you need to be sensitive to it. So, and then as far as, um, you know, developing a process, I think that's the way you want to go. If, if there are uh, projects that can be built in the industrial districts that can go through the same administrative process, I think we should encourage that. Um, it, you know, not... So that's where I would come down on it, that I think it should incorporate more than just this one innovation district. At the end of the day, any policy we set forth or process should incorporate more than just the innovation district. That would be my two cents. All right, so thinking we've worked through that one. Um, number two was what size project would qualify for administrative review based on square footage of a building amount or lot disturbance? It's a good question. There's a lot to it. Rachel. Um, and to me, I, I, I think it's it's the lot disturbance. It's not so much the square footage because you could have um, a small footprint but in a four-story, five-story building, um, which would then have a lot of a lot of square footage, um, a lot of bulk. Uh, I like the the concept of um, taking a look at the the impervious area and the disturbed area. Um, now Jay has given us three suggestions. I think no four building size, impervious area, disturbed area, or some combination thereof. Uh, I like to cover all my bases. What can well, I? Well, yes, you? yes, you did. Thank you very much. Um, at this point, I, I think the, I think the impervious area and the disturbed area is something that's easier in a sense to, to quantify than just say any building of 10,000 square feet must, um, because 10,000 square feet on what sides lot? Uh, in how many floors uh, and how much is being disturbed. It, it's, it's tough to separate, um, but looking at the disturbance and looking at the impervious actually gives you a sense of the size of the building. And I don't know that I've really made myself clear, but those are the two elements that I think are, are the most important, especially uh, in areas as we know where it's sensitive where it's close to um, where we're getting close to the wetlands where we might a developer might be building on something that has an impact downstream uh, and the size of the building actually could end up being determined by what the lot is of the, what the amount of disturbed area would be and the amount of impervious area needed uh, for parking and roads into it so as you start to look at um the projects uh, the the size of the building actually should be the last determiner in terms of what we're looking at and, and nick if you don't mind if i if i could um the one thing that i think staff we've been been thinking about is you know as we talk about the innovation district clearly you know i and not just the innovation district but that's the the, the example that's right before us and frankly Anyway, I'll just leave it at that. Um, you know, I think when we talk about lot disturbance, it's sort of what's already been approved for lot disturbance and impervious coverage. Um, and so I think, you know, through that subdivision process, through that master plan process, the innovation district's been sort of well established as to what can happen on each lot. And our sort of thought would be when they look to exceed that, and I think lot six and lot seven are a pretty good example, right? They sort of had an approval through the planning board about 80% impervious, or I think it's impervious coverage, or maybe it was disturbance, whatever it is, 80%. And they seek to exceed that, go up to the 85. That's a trigger we would see that would go back to the board, because that's something the board's already dealt with. When we start thinking about the um, industrial district, let's say, I don't know that there are any empty lots left in on Washington Avenue, but for the sake of argument, if there were an empty lot on on um, you know down on Washington Avenue, you know sort of 
once we identify, let's say it's 20,000 or 40,000 square feet or whatever you guys sort of think is the right number of disturbance or impervious, that that would have a, you know, once that lot goes over that number, it would go back to the board. Um, but in the in the innovation, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, in the yeah, in innovation district of the downs, if there's obviously it's a green field, right? So these developments are clearly disturbing more than 10, 20,000, 40,000 square feet, whatever that case may be, but that wouldn't necessarily come back to the board if it meets the other parameters. So I just want to, you know, so I think as we craft this or think about it, that might be um, the way I've started to think about framing the ordinance to sort of say, if you're in an already approved subdivision, then it's whatever was approved as part of that. If you're a standalone lot, then your trigger might be this. Um, and so I just want to sort of, you know, identify that, I've, you know, staff's already been sort of thinking about, yeah, we're going to have to create some differentiation, but yet as long as we understand what those, what we think the essential triggers are, we can start to craft something and then debate those further down the line again, of course. Yeah, I, I like what you've laid out, um, Jay. I like the way you're approaching it. Thank you, Rachel. Roger. Yeah, um, I don't know if this would be appropriate, Jay, but um, when when the um, when we first started to consider the innovation district back in, I believe it was December 2018, um, would and you know we went through we we established all the guidelines and everything of that particular district. Would would it be appropriate for the um, planning board at that point to make a decision that we're going, you know, based on everything that's been established for an example like this, that um, any future development, as long as it may, it, it follows those guidelines that have been established at that, at that earlier meeting, um, the earlier process, it could be, everything can go through the administrative process, unless something unusual were to come up, such as the apartments. So you're really seeing it making, well, that, hmm. so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking Would that about fall that. under the, the use that's not really being covered by the administrative review process. Right. So I'm, I'm really thinking about crafting an ordinance and what I'm hearing, Roger, your serve approach would be to address this as conditions of board approvals, which I think, you know, one are sort of more are, can be a little trickier to track um, and aren't at quite as clear, um, set as quite clear expectations. Um, but what I could see is for saying, for example, um, again, the way I'm envisioning drafting this is saying that, you know, this is uh, these uses uh, or, or this process might be eligible in the industrial district, in the light industrial district, and in the innovation district on those lots previously approved as part of the um, regulating plan dated March uh, 1st, 2018, I think it was. Yes, I looked at it pretty recently. <laughs> but, um, and so it would sort of establish that, yes, it's that board approval in the innovation district that sort of it binds those lots to it. Um, so I think it's sort of a, looking backwards to the innovation district. And I think what you're talking about is looking forward. And I guess that would be the question. Uh, does the board feel that this should be applicable generally to the innovation district or not? But certainly if there's land in the innovation district that comes forward as part of a subdivision process, or, you know, um, I think that would be a trigger that would certainly come before the planning board and wouldn't be an administrative process. Um, I also, you know, as staff sort of laid out here, when we think about the thresholds, it's it's staff's opinion. You know, Jamel and Angela and I had up to, have been talking about this quite a bit. That if something triggers a state or federal permit, that's probably something that should go to the board. Um, and really, that's a one-acre threshold. 
at, at a minimum. Uh, you know, certainly if board feels it needs to be smaller, that's fine. But, but for staff, we feel like once it triggers a stormwater permit from, from, uh, from the state or triggers a, a DOT traffic movement permit, that is probably a project that's of, of a significance that clearly to staff's estimation goes beyond that line that we might be comfortable having sort of delegated authority to review. Um, but of course, if council feels otherwise, we'll, we'll accept whatever <laughs> level of authority they want to give us. But um, <laughs> um, so uh, I don't know how, how fully I answered your question, but. All right. Uh, Jennifer, you want to weigh in on that? Yes. Um, sorry, I'm eating. Um, I agree with Jay in that um, any, I do think there's merit in um, sticking to the, um, anything that would requ require any of those state level permits should probably come <clears throat> also before the board. Um, and I know that there was comment earlier about, I think Rachel brought it up about the difference between um, we're just talking through uh, the difference between impervious and disturbed area. Um, can you can someone just remind me offhand the size of those innovation district lots? I think they're generally an acre. I mean, they're designed the typical lot size is an acre. Okay. Um, so I. Uh, this isn't exactly what you asked, but I'm going to mention it before I forget to. I do think it's important to include a public input process in, um, in, in any project, really. And I don't think that that should adhere solely to whether or not a project is adjacent to somebody being residential because I, I can see the situation. Um, if I was a small business owner, for example, I, you know, I, I am hopefully interested in um, neighboring small businesses and would probably want the opportunity to, to comment in a public way and be notified in a public way about other um, <clears throat> businesses that might be coming in to join me and that might be um, they could be very helpful, or maybe it's it's a competing interest or uh, presents a concern, something like that. So I just I do think that that is important. Um, I don't know that it needs to be the whole uh, public hearing, open you know in in person public meeting format, which is sort of the question that I was asking earlier. But I do think it's important to offer those types of abutters um, the opportunity to be informed of of projects coming and the opportunity to provide comment on that one way or the other. Um, <clears throat> aside from that, oops, let me pull this back up. Um, I do think that the, um, sorry, I'm flipping back and forth. Um, uh, you know, I don't have, I, I think that um, one of these memos I know uh, compared Square, building square footage uh, in surrounding towns and how that um, relates to administrative review. I, but I also agree with the point that Jay provided a memo, which is that, um, you know, we probably shouldn't use solely that. And I know that's not what we're talking about here. Um, but I do think that the combination thereof is important because, you know, you might have a large building with a very little amount of, you know, um, improvement area outside of that, or you could have a very small building um, with large impervious, or you might have a big disturbed area that's going to go back as pervious area. But if it's a big enough disturbance, um, we, sh you know, we should be looking at that too. I think, particularly in some of these areas that are sensitive for um, stormwater disturbances and erosion control concerns and things like that. Um, so, you know, I. Certainly, I think it's easy to cap the top end of that, as pointed out in the memo, that you know anything requiring um, one acre or over um, for those disturbance levels and or the state 
permit requirement should trigger board review. Um, you know, I think it is a little bit harder to define the bottom end of, of what that is. Um, I don't, I don't have like numbers to that end in my head. Um, however, I will say that it, it is helpful to see some of the building square foot thresholds from other communities. So perhaps if um, there are similar thresholds for areas of disturbance, that might be helpful for us to um, to see as well. And if that's included in this material and I've overlooked it, I apologize. Um, I also uh, think it would be important to um, have some thought given to um, traffic generation. So, so what type of traffic a development might be bringing because again, with some of our older um, or previously developed areas, that that might be the big one, you know, with a new with a new lot that's undeveloped, it might be your um, your disturbed area that's going to be the, the, the biggest or the most um, stringent trigger for this type of review. Um, but you know, certainly something that might fit all other might fall below all other defined criteria for administrative review. So that's a huge traffic generator. Um, that's definitely going to have impacts beyond just that lot, and you know, I could see that being something. You know, are there off-site mitigation things that might be warranted, for example? Um, so that might be another point to consider about whether or not a, a development like that might be a good topic for the board. And, and Jen, do you have just given your experiences? Because I think you know, obviously, having Angela here on staff and talking with um, you know other engineer, trying to understand the. A lot of disturbance, you know, we can talk about. And again, there's really no right answer to any of this. There's not, um, but I'd be curious to your thoughts. Obviously, you know, when we talk about DOT traffic movement permits, we're at what 100 trips or 99 trips or you know some number. Is there, you know, is is half of that? I mean, do you have a sense of where what type of scope or in your mind do you think would be the right trigger is it 50 is it 20 is it 75 is it the full tmp yeah that's a good um again not coming up with an answer straight yep. off the top of my head but i would be interested and willing to go back and look at you know a handful of recent applications for example ones that that i might think of um you know, and I guess I would open that to the board, the rest of the board as well. Are there other um, <clears throat> projects that we've seen um, recently-ish where um, the, the traffic generation piece of that project was particularly of interest? Um, and what type of trip generation level um, did we see there? I know, for example, the one that does come to mind, um, you know, co coffee. <laughs> Coffee is a big trip generator, and um, you can very easily have a small area of disturbance, a small impervious area, and a huge amount of trips. Um, and that, on some recent projects that we've had, I know has led to conversations about inter intersection, adjacent intersection capacity, roadway capacity. Um, should we be looking for left turn lanes, things like that, which just, you know, do kind of expand, I guess, in my opinion, beyond kind of the limits of that lot and impacts, uh, lar larger impacts to that end. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Jen. Um, Rick? Um, yeah, you know, I was reading through the the memo that um, Dan had prepared back in 2018 and looking at, you know, how city of Saco has it at 30,000 square feet and Portland is 20,000 square feet. Um, you know, and given I'm just looking at the innovation district and Dan just said they were around an acre. So you're looking at that's roughly 43,000 square feet. Um, I don't know, to pick an arbitrary number, um, you know, it's always better to 
start small and work up later on as we, you know, refine this uh, administrative uh, ordinance or whatever we're going to call it. Um, but for a new building going up there and having a threshold of, you know, let's just say 20,000 square feet and below, um, maybe we, we can get through an administrative review and, and not have to include everything. Um, so I, I, I don't know, uh, I just don't have enough experience in, in uh, knowing what's the right fit here. But I suppose if you start small and you find out that it's really not making any efficiencies, then we just get bigger. Um, I don't know. So I, I really can't draw a conclusion on this. Sorry. It's OK. Did we lose Nick? I don't see him on my screen. I know Tom Next said. Nick left. I think, yeah, unfortunately, I think we lost his uh, connection. I know Tom left. He sent me a text and he said he was sorry, but he had something else to attend to. Um, hey, Jay. Yeah. yeah. If you don't mind, I have to draw. So I would just like to lead with some parting words, if you, if you don't mind. I, I definitely want to see this succeed. Uh, I think the objective of this is to actually come up with some kind of crafting on an ordinance. I also sit on the ordinance committee. We all know how long it takes to pass an ordinance in municipal government, especially with the way the current workload that our ordinance committee has got. I mean, this is probably September of next year, to be honest with you. So just as a suggestion, because again, I, I wanna see this successful and I really like what Dan Bacon said. If you could come up with the thresholds or that will keep things in the administrative review, use the innovation district as the proof of concept, grab one or two, push it up through the review process. And as long as the planning board is doing the final approval, my understanding is we don't have to change anything at that time, uh, you know, at that then. But at least we can, you can prove the concept out, make some adjustments in that iterative process. As long as the planning board has the final re final approval, I, I'm not seeing how we would have to uh, either modify or create another ordinance until we get the process down straight that you can pour it over for any light industrial, for any developer. That's just a thought. Because again, it's gonna come into the ordinance committee, it's gonna get hung there. And I, and I know, I think you're trying to craft some, some verbiage for an ordinance to come to the ordinance committee. And that, just a thought. And having said that, I have to leave. Right, uh, I, I, as the vice chair, and since uh, Nick has dropped off, I'd like to thank you for your participation tonight, Ken. And- um, Well, thank you. I, I, it's, complicated working on the ordinance committee and I don't uh, envy Jay trying to craft an ordinance but I, I think we can take a look at perhaps some some things that we can do within okay. the uh, within the guidelines within okay. the, the the rules that would allow uh, some streamlining to go through not clear what they are but I, I suspect we can find some ways so thank you good luck um, let's uh, look at we have three Three more elements uh, that are listed in that section that I think uh, we've kind of gone around and, and talked about them a bit, so it may move pretty quickly. So uh, I'm going to take chair's uh, privilege, which I just invented, and uh, start it off. Um, under the permitting authority, um, my, I, in, in organizations, you always need somebody to blame if things don't work. So my suggestion would be that the um, uh, the review be be vested in the director of planning, but that the in consultation with the other departments and those departments be named so that uh, be clear uh, what those departments are that um, the department the director of planning must get uh, information from. 
um, once we, you know, 15 years in the future, we will probably have a, or may have a different uh, chair of uh, director of planning who uh, may decide just to run off on his or her own. Um, and it's always good to have some checks and balances. So naming those departments provide, provide some of the checks. Um, I would suggest that uh, that the the planning director bring forward um, to the board just simply a report on on what came through. Um, that that's and that all of those departments have been consulted in reaching that decision, uh, in in coming up with what uh, he came up with for the administrative review. Um, the appeals. I'm a little unclear on that. Uh, it says, should staff and or the applicant have the authority uh, to transfer an administrative review to the planning board in certain, certain circumstances? Certainly the staff should have the authority to transfer, from my perspective, to transfer the material to the board when a developer says, I ain't going to do it. Um, or they simply cannot reach a decision. I would suggest, and I'm not sure how exactly it can be worded, but uh, again, in terms of ensuring that people believe that the, uh, the process um, is open and clear, that if a developer feels that the review decision was arbitrary, capricious, or in manifest opposition um, to various zoning, to various codes, um, that the uh, that the applicant could as well bring an, an appeal before the board of whatever the administrative review is. Um, I think if the planning staff does what I know they can do very well, which is work with the developers, uh, the developer certainly will, ends up understanding that it's to its develop its advantage. Um, to work with the staff and come to a decision before it gets to the board. Um, so I think that's, that's a way to take a look at the appeal. In the public process, I, I, I'm hearing that I think there is a sentiment for some sort of a butter notice to go out. Um, and I may I may be wrong, but some sort of a butter notice of administrative review to to go out uh, with um, at least a an opportunity for written comments um, at the point at which the the material whatever is left uh, from the administrative review might come before the board certainly. There is an opportunity for somebody who thinks uh, we're in a butter to come and make a public statement. So that's uh, that's my thought on those three areas. And I think if we can come up with um, the thoughts of the rest of the of the board that's here, then we'll have done some pretty good work tonight. Uh, so let's start, uh, Roger. Rachel, I don't know if you can see, but Nick has uh, yeah, the I was going to defer. I was going to defer to Nick. Nick, uh, in your absence, we settled everything. Thank you very much for your attendance. I heard and uh, I'm just gonna go watch the football game now. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll make it I'll make it quick. So you guys are you guys are, you've been great. I'll, I'll, um, but I'll just say this. I I still um, still very partial to the idea that whatever process is established, the administrative review process, it's squared away with staff, but it ends up on an agenda like a consent item for, and I think, and the reason I would advocate for it is one, one the permitting authority still lies within the planning board. So we as citizens aren't, you know, pushing off a burden to staff to make the ultimate decision. Two, it, it, it allows public to show up and uh, comment on it. Uh, three, if there was an issue, we could request that it be removed from that consent part of it and onto the back end of the agenda. Meaning, if there was an issue that the planning board identified workable with some decision in the background, we would still have the materials on site that night and the opportunity 
for the applicant to be heard that evening and then it could be approved in that same evening if we squared away any misunderstanding. So basically the opportunity to remove it out of, it's kind of a mechanism process that the board still holds that ultimate authority. Um, and that, that would be my two cents. I think that's, that I would be most comfortable with a process that looks like that. Roger. Um, Nick, Nick, the only question, I, I guess the question I have when you say pulled out and put at the end of the agenda, what do we do if it gets 10 o'clock before we hit that? And we've gotten, you know, the applicant came thinking it, uh, you know, there was a consent and all of a sudden uh, something, something halts it and the applicant finds out uh, it has to come back three weeks later. Yeah, I'd hate just for that to happen because that's not the intent behind the process. Um, but I think it also just, uh, well, my, my mind's running. It would also give us a chance as the board to approve it. We don't have a, a waiver outstanding or being approved, a standard having to be approved by staff that doesn't necessarily comply, one less parking space. So I think that under a consent item, we actually check the public comment box, the waiver box, the permitting authority box, and then on top of it, we still maintain that ability to have a full hearing on a project if we had concern. Now, I think you bring up a really good point, Rachel, in saying like, hey, they may not be prepared to uh, go that evening, but I think it at least shows an effort on our part to get them heard that at that same night. And maybe knowing the fact that it's, it's pretty much gonna be a lot of the down um, and they probably have other projects on the on the agenda that evening I don't know if that would make it a little easier or maybe not maybe it's just hey you got to be on your toes you might want to show up for the first first 10 minutes of meeting might you might have to speak at the end of it I don't know but it's a good point yeah I, I think we just need to make sure that we cover it you know in any ordinance um, although I I'm, I'm not sure that this needs to be part of the ordinance, hey, I guess it does, so much as kind of board procedure, um, where, where we can determine how we handle that, while the ordinance concern, the ordinance specifies what's checked off that we approve. And then yeah, we can- I mean, certainly I'll, I'll think about, and I'll contemplate this as part of the ordinance, but I mean, the thing I think about if I'm in the applicant's shoes, they might have just spent six or nine weeks through the administrative review process, um, sort of battling through, you know, different issues and come to a resolution. And, um, and then if it does, as, as was said, sort of, um, you know, just thinking about um, at the last, you know, if it does come to planning board, and for an item, you know, for some reason it gets pulled and then not heard for right another three weeks. It's sort of the, um, the uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not reliability, but just sort of the, the, the um, predictability from the, from the developer side. I do wonder about, um, but I certainly hear what you're, I, I hear what you're talking about, Nick, and I'm almost wondering if there's a way um, to think about it early even um, to sort of bring it and say, these, these are the projects that are going through administrative review process. Um, and, you know, though things may not be fully answered, at least the board can look at it and say, wow, here's a red flag for me. Um, and so just, but we'll certainly, we'll certainly play with yes. different concepts over sure. the next couple of weeks. Yeah, so I mean, I guess there'd be two aspects to that. One is it would have to raise a red flag with more than 50% of the board members in attendance. Yeah. So, and two, if it's raising a red flag with more than 50%, how did it get that far anyway? And how did it not, you, how did you not just pull the plug and say, this should really be a planning board item? Right? I, I, I guess that would be my point behind it. Yeah, I was just going to comment that I think um, it's a great opportunity to kind of do a couple of trials with this and and then work out the the kinks i mean i think you have the consent items already you know and you use it for the really simple changes now um and if if it were an item that we'd have on the agenda we'd be there we'd be prepared to speak with the board um i think there's one next monday you know it's a 
a minor subdivision amendment, we're going to be prepared to speak if other things come up. So I think the applicants have a responsibility to be ready to <laughs> ready to talk about an item, um, whether it's a consent item or a regular item. Yeah, and, and I can appreciate that as well. But I, I guess I, I sometimes come back to, um, and I know I've worked with enough of you on the board. Um, you know, my memos are uh, uh, very, and Jamel has followed the same pattern, deferential to the planning board, because I can harken back to a number of years ago having, you know, board members say, boy, staff, your, your memos are far too directive. You know, leave this, leave this to us. We're, we're the deciders. Um, and so, you know, it's always walking that fine line and appreciate that this board is very supportive of, of staff. And, and so I think, you know, laying out the process of consent with this board over the next couple of months is something we could think about. Um, but I would want to, you know, at some point we need to sort of really figure out and codify what we're, what the expectations are. Um, so I just mentioned that as something to sort of put in the hopper, not as a, <laughs> anyway. Jennifer. Um, I, I, I see the value in the, the consent agenda item model, but I am just curious if that feels, um, like, does that feel expeditious to an applicant? Does that, because if you're still waiting for, you know, say if staff is generally, you know, you've worked through however many, um, iterations or in a few weeks of back and forth with staff on particular items and the the staff feels that okay you know we're comfortable that um, the board would be supportive of this project at the point that it's at but maybe you still have another week or two weeks until the next meeting does that you know just to have that consent agenda heard um, I'm wondering if that achieves the same purpose. I, I guess my understanding of um, seeking this additional type of review would be to sort of, um, you know, allow the, those discussions and approval to happen outside of the regular regularly scheduled and frequency of meetings that we um, currently have in particularly full meetings that we have, which I know is something that Rocky mentioned before was that, you know, this is a model that's being sought, you know, and one of the advantages to that would be a more predictable time frame for um, review and being being heard and receiving an approval um, on, a, on an otherwise fairly straightforward project. So I, I'm just kind of curious. Um, I mean, so my, my perspective is it's sort of a bridge to bridge to that, Jen. And it might also, yeah, so it's a good progress. Uh, there's uh, sort of a ripple effect too, right? So if you have innovation district site plans that are full agenda items that are on your meeting, um, you end up even if you're wildly in favor of everything, <laughs> um, the applicant does a presentation, the board goes down the line and comments on it, and you, you use time on that, then you don't get to other items. Um, there might be other industrial properties that you'd put on the consent too, like for, for the same reasons, and therefore you're able to get through all the regular items on your agenda, for example, or most of them. So it's sort of a cumulative okay. effect, I think, in the, the amount of work and things you have to also review before the meeting. So if you're comfortable with staff handling certain ones, then you're able to focus your preparation on the ones that- I would, I would say too, I mean, I, Dan probably can test this. I mean, the fastest you're getting through us with these things is nine weeks. I mean, at a minimum, it's probably closer to 12 by the time you do the back and forth with the ramp up to getting it to us so, mm -hmm. so maybe it's you know in their world it's uh, we had four you know five weeks or four weeks of back and forth with staff and now we're going to wait two to get on the consent item agenda i think you're so still three there. weeks ahead of the ball from where they are today and then as dan has pointed out 
Now, I think it allows us to maybe get through our agendas quicker and, and not necessarily, um, you know, have one project that can, like he said, clog up the, the rest of the, the, the ones behind it. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, and, that makes sense. Uh, th that's, you know, look, that's, it's my opinion. I, I just, you know, I think it could work, you know? Um, I also think there's value in, uh, you know, points that Rick brought up earlier, which is that, you know, um, perhaps best to start with something like this. And if we figure out that, you know, maybe we don't need to see a consent agenda or something like that, you can always, mo you know, modify it. Um, in the future, but that bypassing that step could potentially be maybe too big a leap. Um, so that's my thoughts on that. Um, and I, I, I do think that um, again, in terms of permitting authority, um, as I said before, I certainly think uh, circulation and input from other staff departments is important. I like the idea of having those defined, um, as Rachel mentioned, department titles change, positions change, things like that. So I think um, outlining those would be helpful. Um, and, and maybe even like, or their designees, if there's another uh, department that might have a consultant on board for to help with the reviews or something like that. Um, and I think it's important to have, you know, the ability for both staff and an applicant to say, I mean, ultimately, right, I, I think that this is generally designed to help applicants, um, you know, it, it, it's more desire, I would think it would be more desirable to just have a staff level review. So they, they should want to, to, um, to do that and meet those criteria. And I'm confident that we'll get to a point that those are clear enough that um, someone can tell pretty quickly whether or not they have a, pro a project that's a good candidate for that or not. Um, but, you know, should um, disputes come up or additional questions, um, I do think it would be important for, for either party really to be able to say, you know, I, I don't agree, um, or I, I would like to hear the full board's opinion on this. And for staff, that that feels like it would be um, a good fallback, you know, if there was a, a project that was too complex or, or changes that came up or something like that. But also um, for an applicant, um, you know, it, it, it would just kind of, be supportive to the staff, I think, to, to, to have that be an option um, should there be disagreement. Um, and in terms of public process, I, I kind of spoke to that before, but I do think that, um, I do think allowing people the opportunity to comment on new neighbors, whatever type that might be, um, or development adjacent to property that they own or a business that they've built is important and um, certainly open to, you know, talking about what that looks like and what kind of time frame is appropriate and things like that. But I, I do think that the, the process itself is um, of value. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to not have the opportunity to speak on something um, that was happening adjacent to me. And if I've been notified about it, I have the option not to, to chime in, but at least then I, you know, I've been made aware. Thanks, Jen. Uh, come on, King. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm on the same page with, with uh, Rachel and, and Jennifer, I think the planning director can assemble a, an adequate team and knows what disciplines or talents are needed for a proper review. So I, I think that that's fairly cut and dry for me. And the appeals, I, I definitely think that either entity, whether it's the planning department or the applicant should, should have the ability to uh, bring it to the planning board if they so choose, uh, knowing that, you know, time is of 
uh, is a factor. And so if they don't want to listen to the planning department and want to fight things a little bit, well, and bring it to an appeal, it's on their dime. Um, but I, I do think they should have that ability to do that and, and to stay transparent with the public. I, I, I'd be hesitant to not have um, uh, the ability for the public to make comments. Now, whether it's send in comments for administrative reviews, I could even go along with that. If it's going to be on a consent, uh, the comments have to come in electronically or snail mail if they still do that anymore. I don't know. Uh, but certainly um, having the public involved um, will keep us out of the fire. That's it. Thanks, Frank. I think that was all of the board members on that one. Is that correct? Roger, right? No, Roger? Um, on, the, uh, on the permitting, I generally I agree with Rachel on just about everything she said. I, I think it should be the planning director of planning with consultation with other departments. On the appeals, I think um, either party um, should be able to bring it to the um, to the board um, if they feel it's you know if they want to plead their case. <laughs> On the public process, I. I I, I think it's always good. But it's always want to know what's going on next door to them. So I think that's that just makes sense. And along with that, if I owned a business and there was I got notification that something else was going in next door or nearby that I thought was totally incompatible with with what I did, what I invested my money in, I would I would make sure I touch base with the planning department and the planning board to raise my concern. So I, I think that's obviously a, uh, everybody wants to know what's going on. Um, on the uh, consent form and everything, I, I, I think I'd defer it to Jay to try and figure out how to, how to do that to, so we don't get it, you know, bottling, bottling up the whole um, process. We're trying to streamline the process and, and I don't think we want to create a um, more bottleneck. Um, the, the only other thing before I sign off on this thing is, have we, have we made a determination on number two? In, in other words, the, uh, what would qualify for the, has that been determined? What I heard through the conversation was I haven't heard a definitive number. What I have heard is that the sort of upper end, if you will, is if it triggers a state or federal permit, that's something I think we, I, based on this conversation and sort of where staff was thinking anyway, we would write in as an automatic trigger. Um, what I thought I heard from the conversation was that, yep, looking at some combination of building size, disturbance, and traffic is sort of the way to go. I think, um, you know, particularly I think when, as I think about, um, building size, you know, and, the, and I think what we could do as well is really think about the difference. I think there's a difference between a renovation site or a, you know, uh, improvement to a site in a greenfield. Um, you know, maybe when we, there, there haven't been any de definitive numbers laid out. Um, so staff's gonna, staff's gonna grapple with that and we'll, we'll throw something at a piece of paper and we'll see, we'll, we'll, we'll kick that around next time around. But, um, yeah, I'm sort of thinking, you know, I think I've seen in other communities where it's been, okay, if you're, and again, I've seen this vary as well. It's, if you have an existing building, uh, you can expand up to, I'm just going to grab something, 10,000 feet, um, up to 10,000 feet or 50% of the building, whichever is greater or let, you know, something, something of that ilk. Um, again, I, um, so I could see that type of thing. Maybe we think about, you know, if we're saying, yes, it's got, should be a combination somewhere of disturbed area plus impervious um, and building size, you know, well, a 20,000 square foot building is likely to disturb more than an acre of, have more than an acre of disturbance. I, one would 
could safely assume, maybe not. It uh, obviously all depends. So I think, you know, you can start to think about, well, maybe uh, you use a certain building size as well as an area of disturbance size. And so, um, so I don't, I, I don't think there has been a definitive answer. I'm throwing out all sorts of just uh, sausage making ideas right now, but that's sort of the pathway that my mind is. So if I'm down the wrong stream, let me know. Otherwise I'm going to keep talking with Jamel and Angela over the next few weeks and we'll come up with something you guys can tell us we messed up on. <laughs> and if I could chime in, if I could chime in for a minute, I don't know if you can hear me. Um, yep, we got you. Okay. Um, one of the things is listening to that too, I guess for my two cents, as, as Jay said, is Jay and Joelle and I kind of try to craft something to put back at you guys. Um, my focus is really going to be making it as simple as possible. Um, I think for the applicant's point of view, as well as staff, um, getting into different percentages of the building or um, disturbed for, in, in trying to get into kind of more of a convoluted kind of um, equation to get to whether or not it meets threshold. Um, I guess my two cents is going to be leaning towards probably disturbed area because that would also encompass your impervious area and it would be a very black and white number. This is what you're doing. Um, and it it always is going to come back with some cons because I've seen that with other towns doing kind of these reviews is if the threshold is where someone threw out 20,000, we're going to get a lot of 19,999 square foot um, disturbed area um, projects. But no matter what number you pick, you're going to get that. So I think we just need to live with that and move on. Um, but I guess that... I just wanted to throw that in there that that's probably going to be where I'm going to be trying to head towards is kind of some simple number that we can put in an ordinance that um, makes it very, a very bright line, as you said. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but um, that's why early on I suggested we just focus on this particular district and I'm under the impression, looking back at the December 2018 memo from Dan, that's what the developers envision, you know, going forth in, in, in this particular district, because I don't know, I, I mean, this is going to be so much, so many different criteria on all these different areas. I mean, you, you look at the different industrial parks, look at Pleasant Hill versus the Scarborough Industrial Park, they're, they're all so different. Uh, where the, the innovation district is 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 not it's it's pretty to me it's pretty defined um so anyways that's just my two cents i won't say anything more about it but i mean if i could jump mess. in as the uh, you know the reviewer i will say that it'll be pretty much the same for me <laughs> um gonna use the same standards for the projects i just you know, it'll be a little bit more black and white, like Angela said, in terms of, did you, do you meet the standard or not? And um, if standards can't be met, then maybe it's more of a board review than a staff review. But I see this as being as simple as possible, but still following the same uh, rule book, let's say. Um, no different than a planning board review, other than just, it's not going to the board. <clears throat> Oh, um, not, not that I want to get too far into the weeds here, um, but I think just for staff, for when you go to craft this, you may want to consider things like the um, time frame that you have to respond on to an applicant. I think that might be um, wise to do that when there's an expectation level, and I don't know if it's going to require you to um, have additional help. I mean, it sounds to me like you're probably busy if they keep using this review process, does that make you busier? Um, and just for that little nugget, um, I did did catch a council meeting where there was a, an issue regarding staffing. So I throw something into the mix. Whereas if you're promising people a tighter time frame and it requires you to take on more staff, I, are you gonna go through that budgeting process? Just food for thought as you build this ordinance language what you're doing to situate behind the scenes. Just that's it. Not that it warranted a big discussion, just a heads up. 
So, um, anyone else? Any anything else that we? And I'll ask that of uh, Jay and Jamel and Angela, uh, or Karen, as you work forward to craft this. Is there any last opinion you need before we can wrap this up tonight? Well, those were really the, the, the sort of key uh, touch points that as I started to put put my mind around this that I, I really was seeking some direction on. I feel feel so we've got a little more clarity about what we're doing and appreciate that. And so we'll, as I said, this is uh, something that will be draft up, drafted up and you guys will see again, you know, um, obviously council, you, we, you heard from Ken, council leadership has a lot of interest in this. So We'll see what process they run that through, but regardless, it's going to come through you minimally at, at a public hearing that, you know, one of those required public hearings that we talked about earlier, Karen. <laughs> um, but um, so, and, and certainly staff will keep you up to date when we do have a draft and it does go, whether it goes straight to council or ordinance committee, uh, you know, I usually, I leave that to Tom to let me know what, <laughs> what pathway that's going uh, when it gets to that level, so. Um, we'll keep you posted. Any um, any board members with any final thoughts as they go upon their way crafting? No. A crafting we will go. Well, I, I just want to thank you all. That was, I think, a very productive conversation. Uh, I hope it was. And uh, that's it. Uh, so I guess I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. Okay. Bye -bye. <laughs> All in favor? All right. Good night, everyone. Thank you very much for your time this evening. It is appreciated.